Mr. Bennett, thank you for being with us. Great being here. I, I want to start by asking a question that the Prime Minister didn't relate to. Uh, I imagine I'm not going to go out on a limb here by, uh, by saying that you're probably not extremely pleased about what President Trump is going to say tonight. Um, my question, however, is there's no free lunches. Are you concerned at all about what the President, the price he's going to ask Israel to pay for recognizing Jerusalem and for saying that he will move the embassy some, sometime in the future? You know, when you do the right thing, there ought not to be a price. Uh, we, we've um, conditioned ourselves to believe that any right move that we do here has to come with a price. But that, that's incorrect. If we um, think about it, uh, you know, the, the Prime Minister was talking about technology. If we could develop a time machine and enter the time machine, we'd fly back 3,020 years right now, right here, we'd be able to meet King David founding the capital of Jerusalem. Way before London was a capital, Paris, Washington. Um, so Jerusalem has been and will always be the Jewish eternal capital. Uh, this is certainly seems to be a, a very uh, good step forward, uh, but a natural one. We do not second guess France's decision to have Paris as its capital. We don't say Marseille will be where our embassy is. We don't say that our embassy will be in New York, it'll be in Washington, D.C. So from here, I, I'd call upon other countries to follow the United States and recognize Jerusalem as the Jewish and Israeli undivided capital. But, I mean, obviously, though, I mean, they're talking about this uh, rather large regional peace plan and Israel is going to be asked to give things uh, in return. Do you think that this is part of that? Do you think that this is the beginning of a chess game? Uh, we're going to give you Israel, now you give us? You know, you talk about chess. Um, I think what we're going to see today th shows that Israel's strategic patience has paid off. You know, we've been told again and again that if we want more acceptance, we have to cut up parts of Israel and hand over to our enemies again and again. The tiniest country in the region, uh, size of New Jersey. So we're expected, expected to sever this tiny country of ours, hand over parts and pieces to be loved. But what we're learning is the contrary. If you had looked at the graph, if anyone can put back uh, Netanyahu's graph of sympathy, I noticed something very interesting. Our drop in sympathy in the Palestinian uh, height of sympathy was at the very moment in 2005 where we gave up parts of Israel. You'd expected that if we're so nice and we're carving out parts of our country, handing it over, you'd see a, a jump in sympathy. But in fact, the world respects strong countries who believe in themselves and the world looks down to, com to countries who are willing to give up their homeland. That's the reality. So you do gain sympathy for a couple of days, but quickly thereafter, you gain derision by carving up your country. Hamas, Fatah have already called for days of rage. Turkey's Erdogan said he's going to cut off ties perhaps with Israel. Iran is obviously not going to let this go unnoticed. Are you worried about the reactions? You know, when I see uh, Khamenei condemning Israel, I know we're doing something right. So, um, you know, nothing good goes easy. Um, you know, when I look at the, the history of Jerusalem um, in, in the War of Independence and I, roughly end of March 1948, uh, things were looking bad. You know, Jerusalem was uh, besieged. Um, no no uh, vehicles could get up. And at that point, uh, Ben-Gurion was faced with a historic decision, pretty unknown, to give up Jerusalem to save Israel. And some of his generals said, you have to give up, you have to sacrifice Jerusalem to save the Galilee and the Negev. And he said, no, no, no. We're gonna dilute our forces all across the country and concentrate them in getting through to Jerusalem. And he knew that there is no Israel without Jerusalem. Zion is Jerusalem. There is no Zionism without Jerusalem. I'd also say that not only is this move not an uh, impediment to peace, in fact, 
it's a drastic move towards peace. Why? Because we'll never achieve peace that is predicated on dividing Jerusalem. But we create a false illusion that we will, hence we feed the ongoing desire of some of our enemies to fight us. When they understand that this move is essentially uh, the United States is adding another brick to the walls of Jerusalem, to the foundations of the Jewish nation, we make a big move forward towards peace. And mind you, peace in the Middle East is not a piece of paper. Peace is the lack of war. That's all we want. Give us the lack of war, we're good. This move, I don't know what will happen in the short term, anything can be. In the long term, it's a big step towards regional peace. In political terms, Israeli political terms, whose victory is this? Is this the governments? Is it the prime minister? Is it the evangelical community in America? Is it Sheldon Adelson's? I mean, who owns this victory, the fact that Trump tonight is going to say that Jerusalem is Israel's capital? Destiny. You know, when something is so unnatural, we're in such an unnatural situation, the only country in the world that its capital is not recognized is in fact the country with the most ancient capital. If you'd give 10 minutes, we could go out and, and find coins in Hebrew from 2,000 years ago. And on it, it says uh, uh, freedom of Zion year 67, right? So this is a very unnatural situation. It's a, a blip in history. It might take another 7 years, 70 years, 700 years. We're the Jews. We live in an eternal uh, timeline. Ultimately, uh, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel and, and to a great degree the capital of the world. You know, Jerusalem is mentioned in, in the, the Bible 669 times. You know how many times it's in the Quran? Zero. Zero. And we, we will always allow uh, uh, Muslims and Christians to, to certainly exercise all uh, religious rights. In fact, Jerusalem is thriving, perhaps as, as almost never before. The last time Jerusalem was doing so well was during King Solomon's reign. But we're doing so well because Jerusalem, again, is in its natural place. It's the capital of the Jewish people. Let's move north for a minute. Uh, Israel's facing great challenges. You've got Hezbollah, which is, again, threatening. You've got Syria trying to entrench themselves in Iran. Uh, you were critical of the government in the past for its policies towards Hamas and Gaza. Do you think the government's on the right track in the north with dealing with these challenges? I, I think we've done a, a very good job in uh, progressing our policy. By the way, I, I certainly want to uh, congratulate Prime Minister Netanyahu and, uh, and then thank uh, uh, President Trump for this uh, upcoming move. I think uh, um, they, they certainly both uh, deserve tremendous credit. And I think as the Prime Minister uh, uh, very eloquently showed, Israel's on a very good track right now. In terms of, of the problem, I think uh, um, the Prime Minister hit the nail on its head. We've got an octopus with a head. The head is Iran, and it sends its proxy arms to envelope us. Envelope us in uh, Lebanon, a host country that hosts a proxy called Hezbollah. There's another host country called Syria, which hosts or is intending to host uh, uh, radical uh, uh, Iranian militias. Interestingly, Khamenei will fight Israel till the last drop of blood of the Lebanese or of the Syrians. When it comes to his own soldiers, he is uh, gun shy. And I think uh, by understanding that Iran is the, the very source of instability in the region, we are gradually adopting our, our policies. One policy that I've been promoting for the past four years is to hold the host country accountable for the messenger. In other words, if in 2006 I, I fought in the Second Lebanon War as a commander of a um, search and destroy uh, a team searching out rocket launchers, we were fighting the, the edge, the tip of the edge of, of the arm of Hezbollah and shedding blood. Now we're telling Lebanon, hey, we're not gonna make that distinction anymore. If you host thousands of rocket launchers within your homes, if you accept 
Hezbollah is part and parcel of government, which you do. If in fact Hezbollah is the major force, military force in Lebanon, then Iran equals, uh, sorry, Lebanon equals Hezbollah, Hezbollah equals uh, uh, Lebanon, and we will hold the Lebanese government accountable for any rocket shot on us from uh, uh, Lebanon. What, what, what does that mean? I mean, it means we're going we're to take out Lebanese infrastructure if Hezbollah starts some kind of confrontation with Israel? It means that when my mom's house in Haifa is under uh, uh, rockets, um, then the same will happen in Lebanon. Okay, see, the, the time is running out, and I just got to ask you a political question because Jerusalem is a wonderful thing. It's in the news today, tomorrow. We're going to go back to the political problems and the, the Prime Minister's... Uh, what problems? Uh, <laughs> the, Anyone aware of, I'm not aware of any problems. The coalition it, problems, it's, it's the scandals. Um, right. if, if the Prime Minister is indicted, what does your party do? You know, the real story of Israel is what the Prime Minister showed two minutes ago. Now there's a lot of fluff. There's a lot of um, uh, noise. Uh, in Israel, we're a country of law. And according to the law, uh, a mere indictment uh, does not topple a government that was elected by millions of people. Uh, we back uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's policies. Sometimes we differ. But by and large, Israel is on the right track. And myself and our very uh, capable Minister of uh, uh, Justice, Ayala Chaked, we stand behind the Prime Minister in making Israel stronger. Thank you. That's all we have time for. Thank you very much.